Judicial Center program. Bankruptcy Law Update. And now, here is our moderator, Vice Dean Lawrence Ponoroff of Tulane University Law School. Hello, and welcome to the second part of this premier program of a new series from the Federal Judicial Center. Twice a year, we're going to be bringing you updates on the latest trends and changes in bankruptcy law. And we will be bringing you the insights and analysis of some of the leading judges, ac academics, and practitioners in this dynamic field. On the program today, as you know, we're pleased again to have with us Judge William Houston Brown from the Western District of Tennessee, Professor David Epstein from the University of Alabama School of Law, Professor Bruce Markell from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas School of Law. Judge Elizabeth Paris from the West, from the District of Oregon, only one district there. And uh, of course, last but certainly not least, Judge Eugene Weedoff from the Northern District of Illinois. We've already taken a look earlier at some important consumer issues in bankruptcy law in part one of this program. Now in part two, we're gonna shift our focus to couple of business and commercial issues. Um, and we're going to start by asking Professor Markell about one of the more controversial Supreme Court cases in the bankruptcy area in a long time. You know, Bruce, the Supreme Court teased us for a long time about when it was going to get, if ever, to the new value exception. And of course, in 203 North LaSalle, the court finally did address the issue of whether a new value exception has uh, survived codification of uh, absolute priority. And, uh, of course, you filed an amicus brief in that case. And now that we have a decision, I find it ironic that I have to start out by asking you, is there a new value exception or not? Bruce, do you let me go why we're calling it the new value exception instead of the new value corollary? I thought that was the major argument of your brief. Well, David uh, and Larry, uh, start with first things first. Um, I think the debate will continue because the Supreme Court didn't answer the question either question, whether or not there's an exception or corollary or what you call it, uh, at least if you take them on their words. The opinion by Justice Souter that came out in May uh, talks at length about what happens in this particular case but explicitly leaves open uh, the issue as to whether or not the 1978 codification uh, left open a role for equity owners, which is really what new value is about. Uh, I'll probably refer to it as new value principles because, as David well knows, I take the position mathematically that it's a corollary exception. But what is it? What we're really talking about is the ability of a debtor's equity owners to continue their participation in the revested debtor after confirmation and under particular circumstances. I don't think anyone uh, has any objection if, in fact, the entity is solvent. But if, in fact, not all debts are paid and not all creditors agree uh, to the plan proposed, uh, then we have questions under what terms can a debtor's equity um, this has been a historic question in bankruptcy law. It goes all the way back to equity receiverships when it was very common uh, for syndicates out of New York to be put together of existing shareholders. Uh, it continued into the 30s when we had the first codification of the bankruptcy laws in old Chapter 77, 77B, and Chapter X. The court uh, was given a statute, and we have a lot of cases from the late 30s and early 40s, that basically said, well, plans have to be fair and equitable. Uh, just those words. Uh, because of that, at least in 1939, when Justice Douglas decided Case versus Los Angeles Lumber, he left open the possibility that a lot of the old jurisprudence from before the Depression survived. That is, that equity holders could continue to participate uh, when, they, when creditors weren't paid in full uh, and when there was a dissent about the continuation. Now, the problem is that because of the way Chapter X, which replaced uh, 77B in 1938, was drafted, there wasn't a lot of incentive for the equity holders to stick around. In, in most all cases under Chapter X, uh, a trustee was immediately appointed. Uh, moreover, in Chapter XI, which was the, 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 if you will, the practitioner's preferred vehicle, there was no fair and equitable rule, just like in Chapter 13 today. So this really wasn't that much of an issue until we fused the old Chapter XI concept of a debtor in possession and the fair and equitable rule of old Chapter X in the 1978 code. Now, this issue first came up when the new value exception kind of made its way to the court the first time in 1988. There in Ehlers, uh, 
the Solicitor General suggested that because the Bankruptcy Code in 1978 did not anywhere talk about good value exception, good value corollary, new value, that just wasn't there. That you just take the statute as it, as it, as it is, and that's it. Now, the problem with that is that there is a very complicated history to the provision that was at issue, or that's at issue in 203 North LaSalle. In fact, the court treated it as a statutory interpretation case. 1129B2B2 uh, says that no equity holder or actually even in, uh, a creditor can receive or retain on account of their equity interest any property so long as there's a dissent in the senior class. Now, uh, those who propose new value said there's a simpler way to write that if you just want to write out uh, junior interest, and that's necessarily they can't receive their stain any property, period. But because we have the words on account of, the question is, is there some kind of causal connection between the interest retained post-confirmation and the interest that they held pre-confirmation? Um, and the Supreme Court looked at that in the context of the facts of 203 North LaSalle, which is another single asset debtor case, sometimes I call SADS, um, which, with good reason, uh, with good reason uh, because I think that, uh, that SADS are, are single-handedly responsible for screwing up a lot of law in Chapter 11. I think 203 North LaSalle, they've proven to be no exception to that rule. Uh, there you had a, 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 a single asset debtor, a partnership, which Judge Rudolph was a trial court judge, that had 15 floors of a Chicago office building just inside the loop. Uh, they also had a lender who had lent over $90 million, Bank of America, with respect to their acquisition and improvement of that building. Um, and then we have a, a Chicago real estate slump, so big a slump that the property uh, as valued in the bankruptcy proceeding was only worth about $56 million. The plan was pretty simple. Pay every unsecured creditor in full except uh, the deficiency claim. And because of Seventh Circuit claims, they had to separately classify that, and they paid a little bit dividend. We'll talk about that in a second. They were then going to take the crammed down rules of 1129B2A uh, and say, well, you know, we'll treat this as a new loan at the existing market rate, at the existing value. That left the deficiency claim, a significant claim, the difference between about $93 million and $56 million. What do you do with that? Well, note that because they're in Chapter 11, we're even talking about claim. If we're outside in a state court foreclosure, if we're in a Chapter 7, this claim has zero value because only in Chapter 11, under 1111, does this claim have any value. So what the partnership said is it's not um, a full claim, uh, but what we'll do is we'll pay it out of some proceeds of sale or refinancing down the road. Uh, and the estimate was that that was going to be worth about 16% uh, of whatever the deficiency claim turned out to be. Bank of America said, however, you know, as we look at absolute priority, which we all know is part of the fair and equitable requirement, um, I've got to be paid in full. My claim was $90 plus million. dollars. I'm not getting $90 plus million. dollars. Uh, what I'm getting is a new loan spread out over time and a hope uh, that you're going to get something in the future. And by the way, the same equity holders, or more or less the same equity holders as before. And to their point of view, absolute value was not uh, met. To the partnership's point of view, they said, listen, all this history uh, is on our side. And what we're going to do is we're going to contribute over time up to $6 million. Moreover, the reason we're going to do that, as acknowledged by the Supreme Court, is they had tax recapture. If, in fact, they lost the property either at state court foreclosure or through some type of bankruptcy proceeding, their partners were going to take a significant tax hit. So within the plan itself, they set up an exclusive provision that only equity holders, current equity holders, could, could buy into the revised uh, or revested debt. And so this goes up to the Seventh Circuit, which uh, uh, basically uh, two to one affirms and to the Supreme Court. This time, uh, unlike Ehlers, um, unlike the Bonner Mall case of the mid-90s, they actually tried to wrestle with the issue. And the question is whether they wrestled with the issue in a way that um, those in the, uh, us in academia can say responsible uh, judicial management or not. And to my way of um, thinking, we've kind of caused about 15 more years of litigation to figure out what this case really means. And here's why I think we did. If you go through the court's logic, the court sets out the fact that bankruptcy and special reorganization serves two goals. One goal is the reorganization and rehabilitation of the debtor. The second goal is the maximum return to creditors. So, well, it's pretty easy in this case. We just have to meet both goals with respect to the new value claim. So what we have to do is we have to assure that if the equity holders continue, which is one of the goals of, of reorganization, we're not going to say that they can't, recoup, can, can't continue. Indeed, the court called both the Solicitor General and the, and the bank's position on that 
Archie, and then we actually kind of dismissed it out of hand. Said so if in fact we are going to continue, we have to continue on a basis upon which we can be assured that top dollar is being returned to the creditors. And in fact, they use that term, top dollar, uh, several times. Well, the question is, how do you determine that? Or what was the problem here? Uh, the debtor said, well, what do you mean by that? You know, the, the statute which you say that we're interpreting, that you're interpreting, 1129B2B, says we have to retain property. Well, what property do we use here? Uh, it's not necessary, because this is new equity issue, new equity that we're issuing. It's brand new. Uh, it's not the same equity holders. Indeed, there's a substantial turnover. Not all the partners decided to pony up. The court focused on saying, well, what you did in the plan by allocating, if you will, the post-confirmation interest only among the existing equity holders, that's a species of property. Uh, it's not exclusivity in the bankruptcy code. It's really the ability within the plan to kind of offer this um, combined equity interest. And because you did that, we have to assure that this is a method that we return top dollar. Now, had this been, I think, Justice Douglas, and had this been in the 30s and 40s, um, what Judge Weedoff did then would have been stamped with a, uh, a stamp of approval and a hearty congratulations. I mean, he did a good job valuing uh, the debtor uh, in because you know, they had experts on both sides. The court, however, takes an unusual twist and says, and I, I think a twist away from a lot of prior cases, and saying this top dollar has to be tested by the market. That, in fact, there has to be somebody other than the debtor or debtor's equity holders proposing and the judge either saying yes or no. But we've got to kind of somehow test this um, against the market. And the court then hinted at ways in which this market test might be done. It said, well, one thing that we might do is, well, don't just have the, the auction, if you will, among the debtor's partners. Open it up. Let anybody come in and bid. Of course, that's completely contrary to why the debtor's equity holders wanted to bid anyway, because if you let other people in or other people bid, they're not willing to put up the six million. But the court said, we're not going to be concerned with their particular motivations for doing this. We want to ensure that creditors get top dollar. We want other people's maybe to propose to bid plainly. Of course, the uh, well, let's, let's just back up for a sure. second. You, 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 you commented that the way the Supreme Court looked at it uh, said it isn't exactly exclusivity. Of course, the Debtor's exclusivity was an essential factor in the case, I would think, and a, a driving factor behind the Supreme Court's decision. But isn't the LaSalle case a case that is going to come up in the context of exclusivity hearings? And isn't this going to affect what judges do with respect to exclusivity? I could foresee or anticipate, for example, a, a judge taking the viewpoint, well, I might as well end exclusivity because the only way that a plan is going to be confirmed is going to be a plan that involves a, a debtor contribution. And, and so let me just go ahead and end exclusivity now and, and figure out what is there in the market through the plan process. But I could also see a judge doing a take at an exclusivity hearing with respect to, to LaSalle in that, well, I don't have to worry about ending exclusivity because I know that whatever plan is confirmed is going to have to include some sort of market process. And I think you'll see that coming up probably in disclosure statement hearings, right? Because of the rule that a lot of courts sure, have said. Earlier. Yeah. Uh, or even earlier, maybe in relief from stay, right. um, uh, which is actually the vehicle that many new value cases came up uh, before uh, 203 North and South. I think exclusivity is kind of a double-edged sword. Um, I indicated in the outline for the program that if you take a look at Chapter 11s generally, the last year was the first year, I think, since 1978 that Chapter 11 filings fell below 10,000. When we have a million four bankruptcy filings, generally only 10,000 Chapter 11s, you ask yourself, what, um, what's all the, the fuss about? Well, some of those are pretty big. I mean, 80 to, 80 to 120 are actually public companies. But at the same time, of those 10,000, if you kind of boil it down, maybe 7,000 of them have less than 5 million in assets. So one of the things that I've heard that people are doing in response to this is that it, not rather than having the court terminate exclusivity, the debt is coming in and saying, here's our plan. By the way, we terminate exclusivity. Any of you want this small business that requires these owners in order to operate the way in which it has, fine, come make your plan. The market tests to value when 90% of the companies in Chapter 11, there is no meaningful market for, uh, for the company. So I'm going to want to get back to the judges and ask them now that they have such specific guidance from the Supreme Court on how to determine top dollar, what they're going to do. But, but Bruce, let me, let me pose to you um, another question because I've heard 
sort of conflicting views in, in people's assessment of 203 North LaSalle. One view is that the Supreme Court has raised the bar too high for old equity, and the result of the decision is going to be dis to discourage old equity owners from wanting to participate in the uh, reorganized debtor to a new value. The other view is, uh, ironically, the result of this case, maybe particularly in the small business cases, is that old equity is going to get the company cheaper. Um, I think time is going to tell, and time is, and the reason that I can't do that now is that it's going to be interesting to see what judges, such as those on our panel here today, will do when these cases come up. I mean, it may very well be that, I mean, again, to go back to courts, that there might be two ways to do it. They don't say it's exclusive, they just say, and they don't even say that they're appropriate in all cases. One would be determining exclusivity, and the other is maybe keep exclusivity, but have an auction in the plan where comers can come and bid what they will. Now, my guess is that uh, unless you've got a really active secured creditor, because I mean, again, a lot of these small cases don't even have that function of creditor committees, right? Unless you've got a really active secured creditor, uh, what you're going to have, if the debtor looks at it, they'll say, okay, we'll turn exclusivity. Uh, well, most lenders will bring on a liquidation plan. Um, and then we go, say we have then two confirmable plans. Well, 1129C says that in such cases with two confirmable plans, one of the interests that you have to take into account is the interest of the debtor's equity owners. It almost puts the thumb on the scale in favor of reorganization, at least some courts have held. So I think in that case, you, may, you, you might get into it. I think the, the problem is, is that one of the reasons there's no market for these small companies is it's really difficult to, to value them. Um, it, it, it boggles my mind to think that some bank's uh, you know, workout department is going to take in these companies and run them. No. They're, they're simply not. Um, and to the extent that you really want to reorganize, perhaps is that we're just going to we're going to terminate exclusively. But it's, it's like having a game and no one comes. Right? We'll say anybody can play, but no one's going to file a plan because it's actually a fairly expensive proposition to do anything other than a liquidation plan. I think the first question needs to be addressed is what is it that the market's testing? I think what the Supreme Court is saying is that the market is supposed to test the value of the residual ownership. Not the value of the collateral. So in, you're, you're have a, you have a, se a secured claim, as in 203 North LaSalle, that's worth a certain amount. The bankruptcy court still has to determine the amount of that claim. That's a 506A secured claim. There's something else left over. That's the right of ownership. And what we're, what we're putting up to auction potentially or trying to somehow expose to the market is that value of ownership. When is there value to ownership that's worth more than the underlying collateral if the collateral is the entire asset base of the debtor? Only in strange circumstances where the owners have a adverse tax consequence. It's worth more to them than the value of the, of the underlying asset. They or have an idiosyncratic exactly. reason for wanting to continue. Or maybe it's because it's a family business and they're family's name is attached to it, and they want to continue that business in that name. Or maybe it's an individual in Chapter 11 whose house is the asset, and the family lives in that house. They would like to stay there even though they'll pay more than the, the market value of the home. Those that's are the be, reasons. You know, that's going to be a real problem, too, because of those 10,000 uh, Chapter 11 filings, maybe 1,000 or 1,500 are individuals. And if the new legislation tends to push more people to 11s rather than 13s, this is going to be an interesting because what does an individual have to contribute that's going to value? Well, it's it's going exemption. To up, it's going to come up in farm cases, too. Right. Right. Notwithstanding Chapter 12, there are many farm uh, operations that prefer to file Chapter 11 rather than Chapter 12, even though they may be eligible for that. And then the question is, what, why would a creditor want to bid more than the value of the collateral? And the reason is the creditor would prefer to liquidate rather than have the debtor continue to manage the business. And then it's a question of, is the creditor going to want to pay more for that right to liquidate than the debtor is going to want to pay to maintain ownership? Well, let me ask you another question that's related to that, and that is, occasionally we see plans where it's a competitor creditor who wants to mm -hmm. bid because they want to put the competitor debtor out of business. Mm -hmm. uh, often these arise in, uh, where there have been judgments and patent disputes uh, or intellectual property issues. Uh, and you have what is basically a viable business, but for this patent problem. And those, I think, pose quite clearly the, the, the problem of if you want to save
a business, at least long enough to let the appeal go forward, uh, if it's a bidding contest, the debtors and its equity isn't going to have the economic strength to win the bid. Well, this was my uh, <coughs> fantasy in practice, which is I'm going to cut off a judge. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, we're out of time on, oh. on this particular uh, issue. Um, it's an interesting one, and, and I suspect uh, we'll know a lot more, but probably no definitive answers um, even a year from now. Um, we want to turn uh, next to, um, to David to talk to us a little bit about my least favorite section uh, of the Bankruptcy Code, Section 365. I didn't understand it when they first enacted it in 1978, and they've done nothing to make it uh, more uh, intelligible. Um, let me start, David, by asking you, um, the um, limitation on the ability of the debtor to assign in Section 365C1, where the uh, third party uh, has uh, the personal performance of the debtor as material to, that, to the performance and allows uh, uh, the enforcement of that restriction, um, certainly restricts assignment. I never um, realized that it might also restrict assumption, but perhaps I'm wrong about that. Well, lots to be right or wrong about with Section 365, and I'm grateful I have the chance to talk about 365 instead of what Liz was, was talking about, the last competitor-creditor. It's really hard to say. That's one of those phrases where you get started and you feel like you can't stop. 365 <laughs> has been kind of the same way for Congress once it's gotten started, and it just hasn't stopped, uh, and it's sort of appropriate, I think we be doing 365 just before hearing about what Congress is going to be blessing us with next in the bankruptcy area because it, it, it seems well there's plenty of blame to be shared in, in, in the academy because 365 really it, it follows up on 70B which was invented by a Harvard professor, Professor McLaughlin, but it, but it seems to me that every time professors, Congress, commissions get involved in 365 it gets worse. Start with the question that, that you raised, Larry. And that's the question of assumption and assignment in Section 365C1. Look, we all know that assumption and assignment are fundamentally different. That if I've got a contract with Bruce and Bruce goes into bankruptcy and Bruce wants to keep the contract, that, that what we're really talking about here is that we're talking about an assumption. But if, on the other hand, Bruce wants to transfer the contract to Bill, then what we're talking about is an assignment. And it's a very different kind of a deal where I made my deal with Bruce, and, and I really shouldn't have any problems with Bruce continuing the deal in bankruptcy, assuming that he can provide the adequate assurance of future performance if he's in default. But if, on the other hand, I made my deal with Bruce, and now I'm dealing with Bill, there are all sorts of obvious constraints. And so it would seem that Congress would recognize there's assumption, there's assignment, they're both dealt with by 365, but they're different. Well, the problem that, that Larry alludes to is a problem created by the language that Congress chose to use at the very beginning of Section 365C1. Section 365C1, as you all know, begins with the phrase, may not assume or assign. There is a linkage of assume with assign. May not assume or assign it play that out, what that seems to mean is that if under applicable law, to use the phrase that's used in Section 365, which really means, of course, non-bankruptcy law, if under non-bankruptcy law, it would not be possible to transfer a contract, then in bankruptcy, it's not going to be possible to keep We've got a Ninth Circuit case that reminds us of that problem, and it reminds us of that problem in a context that I think we're going to be seeing more and more. It's an intellectual property conflict, rather, or non-bankruptcy limitations on transfers of intellectual property, as Catapult discovered. Went into bankruptcy, had a vital intellectual property contract. Retention of that contract was essential to continued operation. Didn't want to transfer the property. It wasn't Bruce saying, well, we'll let Bill do the contract with you. It was Bruce, in essence, saying, I want to keep doing the contract with you. And what happened in the case is, as other circuits have previously held, the Ninth Circuit concludes, since Catapult could not have transferred, since it was not assignable under non-bankruptcy law, can't be assumed. The problem. That's, that's, Excuse me. That's plainly Jim. what the language says, right? Yes. But, yeah. but is there any conceivable justification in policy terms for that result? 
Well, uh, I don't know. It, it seems to me that the harder and more appropriate question is, is given the policy concern, is there any conceivable way, given the statutory language, uh, that a bankruptcy judge can disregard the statutory language and rule another way? And, and we're not necessarily talking about complicated intellectual property contracts. Uh, Bruce just alluded to the you know, number of Chapter 11 cases that are uh, cases involving individuals, uh, personal services contracts, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, David, can't you read it quick that the debtor may not assume and assign if the uh, uh, performance of the uh, debtor is material, um, but the debtor may uh, assume, may not assume and assign, but yeah, may because assume? Because the assumption is a prerequisite to, to assignment. So all they're doing is just being duplicative. They could have said a sign and said the same thing. What sort of a southern region? You kind of slur your words. You know, <laughs> people don't really notice what the statute says. But, but you know, that, that's just a start of, of the sort of concern that one gets from looking at 365 of, of further con congressional tinkering or further professional tinkering uh, with the bankruptcy code. Another example from 365 that, that people run into all the time and, and that comes up in a wide variety of ways in the course, and, and there's some new cases on this, is the gap period. What's the obligation during the gap period? You know, this period during which the debtor is going to decide whether to reject or to assume. All sorts of arguments can be made that the gap period ought to be as long as it can be, so long as the non-debtor party is accurately provided for, because that way you're avoiding saddling the estate with a tremendous financial obligation. You don't necessarily know that the Chapter 11 is going to work. The lease that gets assumed in month four of a Chapter 11 case turns out to be an albatross in month 13 when you're dealing with a Chapter 7 case. And so there's this issue of, okay, let's postpone or defer this issue of assumption or rejection as long as we possibly can, but let's take care of the non-debtor party. Uh, and that's the essence of, of 365D that was added on in large part in 1984. And, and as I look at the cases, it, it seems to me that y'all are being asked to deal with two separate but related questions. The first is, is the question of, of what kind of payments need to be made. What kind of payment? And the statutory language is under any unexpired lease. And so it would seem to me that the, the critical word is under. That's the statutory language that you've got to play with. But the thing is that y'all really aren't the first guys that get to play with the language. Uh, the language first gets played with by practicing attorneys. And so you're, you're facing really a basic question of how do you reconcile what parties agreed to with economic reality? Let me just give you a real easy example. Let's assume that I own a business and I sell this business to Bill. And Bill's going to make periodic payments to me. And, and that's it. It's just an obligation to make payments. It's essentially a debt instrument, not treated as a 365 transaction. But I also own a building. That's vital. That's where the business is conducted. I sell the business. I want to keep the building. But I'm going to lease the building to Bill. And the lease is a 365 transaction. Well, I'm the lawyer setting up the deal. I have had bankruptcy 101, and I know this word under. And so I set up the documents in such a way so that the payment obligation under the lease is not only to pay what would be the rental amount, but to make the payments on the business. Is that under any expired lease. If so, if Bill wants to, after he's filed for Chapter 11, continue and comply with 365D, doesn't that have a very significant impact on the payments? But wait a minute, Epstein, the, the economic realities of the deal is just part of that's rent and part of it's something else. Uh, but it seems to me that it puts Gene and, 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 and Liz and Bill in, in an awkward situation of having to try to decide to what extent am I going to be influenced by what I think are the economic realities of the deal, and to what extent am I going to look at the language of the parties? The fortunate thing for us is that in interpreting contracts, we have 
have significantly more leeway than interpreting statutes. Uh, and courts routinely look behind the actual language of an agreement to reach what they think the reality is, and I expect that could be done in this situation. Yeah, you're not saying that, that there's talismanic qualities to the word lease, that any time I put lease on any obligation, I somehow have taken it into 365, are you? Well, no, but, but when you talk about looking behind, it almost gets to the point where, where you're only going to need not only a Lexus in, in Westlaw, but a 900 number to get to the psychic network. <laughs> because I would think that, you know, practicing lawyers can be just as creative in drafting as you guys could be looking behind. Let me, let me just give you another example. Let's assume that uh, I'm leasing a building to Bill, and he wants substantial improvements done. And I've got a rental rate that I want to cover the cost of the substantial improvements. Now, if I do this separately in any way, uh, then it seems to me that a court could very easily say, okay, what we really have here is an obligation, an obligation that arose before, and as a result, that's not a 365D. But what if all that you're presented with is nothing at all about improvements. You're simply presented with a lease that says this is the monthly rental rate. Are you going to now look behind the document? And you look behind it and look on the other side of it. There's nothing <laughs> written on the other side of it. Looking behind in that situation means it seems to me that you're not interpreting the contract but totally disregarding the contract. Basis in that hypothetical for not treating it as a lease. It really is property that the landlord paid for and that is being used by the tenant during the term of the lease and will belong to the landlord at the end of the lease. So that looks very much like a real lease. Now, if we added something to your hypothetical and said that at the end of the lease term, the tenant would own those improvements, then there would be something on the face of the lease that would give a basis for looking at the economic reality. The other downside to a lot of what you're saying, David, is that you know, as crafty and as adroit as lawyers are going to be when drafting this, they know that if they tie it all into a lease, there's a possibility that if, if the payout is any long term, the person can find another place. That way, you you then they just file and reject the whole lease. They've rejected the entire business op, uh, obligation, and, and then you're done. So I, it may be crafty to get it, but I don't know if you're going to get to that kind of pure. This is just a lease. Here's your payment. Uh, and even though you think it, and even though you think it's too high, it's really for a lot of other things. But that's that's an invisible ink, right? Um, I I, th I think you're going to have some problems in doing that because again, the cross default cases, right? You, you can take baby steps up to what you're saying is that people will say, um, you know, this lease is uh, cross defaulted or a default of other agreements we do. Of course, I've had no trouble saying with respect to an assumption, for example, on Cure. But that's an anti-assignment clause that we can really get away with. I mean, I think Gene's absolutely right. Your discretion in terms of interpreting what people are. I mean, in one sense, we're going to have a platonic ideal of what a lease is, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, listen, from the academy, I can say that kind of stuff, right? Well, you, you've read those parts of Plato where he talks about <laughs> leases. <laughs> leases <laughs> leases <laughs> I, thought the, I thought the, the lease of the cave. Not, not, every, lease of the not cave. every library has that. But, uh. <laughs> well, it's the lease of the cave. You know, it's, it's, it's that metaphor. So I'll agree. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the point is, is that I think that I think I've always thought in 365 that that's a section for lawyers who don't want to take bankruptcy. That's the section they got to read and get understand because I think there is a lot of rights and stuff that you can set up ahead of time. But I think you may be going too far too fast to say the whole thing can be dumped into at least the whole thing dumped into improvements. I don't think that's what I'm suggesting, Bruce. I, I, I think that I'm suggesting nothing more than the questions under 360. 5B present a, a problem of having to, to balance or reconcile the economic realities of a deal with the way that lawyers have drafted a deal. And, and, and that difficult balance is, is not helped a lot by the statutory language. And we, have, in essence, have two different phrases under 365B that the court's got to wrestle with. I've talked about one of the phrases, and that's this phrase, under any unexpired lease. And it may well be that my, my example with respect to the improvements in particular uh, is, 
is really more one that's governed by the other critical phrase in 365D, and, and that's the phrase arising from and after the sort of when component, what point in time component of 365D. And, and you know, y'all have litigated that and adjudicated that primarily in the context of taxes and the situation in which the petition is filed in the middle of the tax year and you're trying to figure out how to deal with the lease provision that requires the payment of taxes. And of course, we know that the cases are divided and we only have a single circuit that's addressed that, the Seventh Circuit in Handy Andy. But to further sort of, I think, make this point about the difficult balance between economic reality and the language used by the parties as a follow-up case. It hadn't gotten nearly the attention that Handy Andy has, but I think it's potentially significant. There's a bankruptcy court decision out of Indiana, a Seventh Circuit bankruptcy court, uh, the Consolidated Industries case that suggests that, that the real key is the language that's employed in the lease with respect to the, uh, the obligation to pay taxes. And indeed, Consolidated Industries can be read as suggesting that if different language had been used uh, in the lease, that Handy Andy might have come out different. But I think the, the sort of best example of sort of the importance of language is, is not language in a document. But sort of the, the final example that I would like to raise about what Congress and others have done every time we try to fix a 365D problem. And, and that's the problem of 365B2D. The problem of what happens where there is a non-monetary default prior to the filing of the bankruptcy petition. The situation in which you have, for example, a business that closes, notwithstanding a provision in the ex executory contract, the franchise agreement, that says you can't go dark for more than 24 hours, 48 hours, or 72 hours. And of course, we know we've got this phrase, penalty rate or provision. We only have one circuit court to date that's interpreted that language in the Claremont case. Uh, but the way that that provision has, has worked out up to this point hardly gives one a great deal of confidence that 365 problems are likely to disappear as a result of the efforts of Congress. Well, Claremont says penalty modifies rate, but not monetary default. Uh, Claremont says that it is real important to save your notes from high school English if you're going to try to get bankruptcy. <laughs> well, I, on that high note, uh, in fact, we're out of time for 365, and of course, we barely scratched the surface. Uh, David, thank you very sure. much. Um, that's it for this uh, part of the presentation of the program. Of course, when we come back, we'll be taking a look at the bankruptcy reform legislation on Capitol Hill and talking to somebody who's been working on that issue for a number of years. We'll be right back. Welcome back. As you all certainly know, the U.S. Senate passed S-625, the Bankruptcy Reform Act, in early February. The House, of course, had already passed similar but not identical legislation, H.R. 833, last fall. As we tape this program on February 11th, the two houses of Congress are planning to set up a conference committee to try to come up with a single compromise bill they can both agree to and that the president can sign. With us to talk about the legislation is Joseph Rubin, Legislative Director for Congressman George Fikas, Republican of Pennsylvania. Mr. Fikas, of course, was the, the chief sponsor of the bankruptcy bill in the House. Mr. Rubin has been working on this legislation for a number of years and fortunately has a good sense of humor as well. Mr. Rubin, thanks for coming. We appreciate it. I know the panel has lots of questions for you. I'll ask you just very quickly to outline for us what you see as the process and timing uh, for the conference committee. Well, first, thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it, and I appreciate all your uh, comments and help over the last couple years putting the legislation together and uh, all your expertise in, in helping us work through some of these difficult issues. Uh, the timing is um, a little bit up in the air at this point uh, because the Senate passed a 
a tax provision uh, included in their bill, which is constitutionally not permissible. So uh, we're trying to work out whether or not how that's going to work with the minimum wage and the house provisions. Uh, but we think that uh, timing conference should be underway at the latest by early March, and we think the bills are close enough together, at least uh, on the bankruptcy provisions, that we'll have a bill ready to go uh, probably by the end of March. So we're looking forward to it and, and think it's something that we can accomplish this year. Do you think uh, one of the areas where the bills differ in a particular interest to me and, of course, Judge Brown, is the uh, homestead exemption? Uh, not only are the amounts different, but the House bill has an opt-out from the homestead cap. The Senate bill doesn't, causing the bill to lose some votes from senators in uh, limited homestead jurisdictions. Um, where do you see that one coming out? Well, we have worked very hard in the House to ensure that there is an opt-out provision uh, in the bill, and uh, we're confident that that will be included in any final package. The question that for us at this point is, where is the number going to be? But the opt-out is, is pretty important, and uh, we're confident that people on both sides of the aisle, and on uh, both House and Senate, uh, will be willing to support that in the final package. When you, you say that uh, you think that will be worked out, but the number is the flexible thing, do you, do you see any possibility of the homestead cap going away at all in conference, or you, you believe it will stay in? It will stay in. Um, there are senators on both sides, uh, senators and congressmen on both sides, who strongly support a cap. Uh, and, for example, Senator Sessions was comfrey last year, and we anticipate he'll be a comfrey this year. He's a very strong supporter of maintaining a cap. Uh, the Senate passed a $100,000 cap and uh, rejected an opt-out provision on the, on the Senate floor and vote. So we think that, uh, we're, that there will be a cap. Several of, of the judges are interested, and they may be more interested than practitioners who don't focus on this issue in, in the appellate structure. Right now we have uh, uh, appeals going to the district court, possibly going, if the circuit has adopted that, uh, going to the bankruptcy appellate panel and then on to the circuit. Uh, the House bill has one provision about appeals, and the Senate uh, bill, I think, says nothing about appeals. What's your prediction of where that will fall out? In the House, Mr. Geekus has worked very hard to come up with a compromise um, direct appeals provision. Uh, it's not a straight direct appeal, but we've worked with a number of judges and academics to come up with a sort of hybrid provision uh, on the House bill. And we've worked very closely, for example, with the ABA. They strongly support our provision. Uh, and we're pretty confident that uh, the Senate will recede to us and allow us to move forward with our direct appeal provision. You know, there are some things that happen in the legislation that look to most bankruptcy practitioners simply to be mistakes, or you know, technical mistakes that uh, inadvertently have gotten involved. Uh, one example of that is changing the priority for support payments to the number one priority in, in bankruptcy distribution. The concern that people have is that that's ahead of the cost of administration. And so what happens is that in any case in Chapter 7 where there's not enough money, both to pay the costs of administration and to pay all the outstanding support recipients, a trustee won't be able to administer the assets. A trustee will wind up abandoning the assets because the trustee won't be able to pay the professionals who need to liquidate the assets. So from most of uh, our perspective, it would be much wiser to allow the costs of administration to be paid ahead of the support obligations to allow the support obligations to be paid at all. Is there any chance that the conference will be able to address that problem? Well, that was not a mistake. That was done intentionally. Um, one of the criticisms that we have received about the bill, unjustified in our view, was about the child support provisions, that the bill is harsh towards uh, child support creditors and, and goes overboard and things like that. But in fact, uh, the bill has had the support of all of the, almost all of the major child support collection agencies in the country. And we wanted to demonstrate that we are being very careful to ensure that child support is first. And we wanted to demonstrate that uh, in the bill by putting it as first priority. That being said, uh, Mr. Geekus is, is committed to trying to move it to second priority 
you know, it was a political decision to move it to first priority. Uh, but, you know, obviously we think that it will have to move to second priority. Uh, but the Senate has it as first priority as well. So that, that's something to be worked out in conference. Well, if it doesn't get worked out, we're curious what your vision is of how this would work. Would it be, as Gene suggests, that the trustee just abandons the property? Or would the expectation be that uh, U.S. trustees serve in those cases as tr case trustees so the property could be administered? Well, again, I think that's something that, that does have to be worked out. Um, and we would like to see it moved down to second priority, but uh, we don't know where the Senate is going to come down on that. And we don't know where the Democrats are going to come down on it. The Democrats insist that child support uh, and main, uh, maintain its first priority. That's something that we'll probably have to uh, have to look at very closely. Joe, when we talk uh, here about some possible changes in, in conference work, some of the viewers may be wondering what role, if any, do outsiders, that is, people outside of the conference committee or the Congress, can they play any role? I mean, is there still a reception to getting uh, suggestions? I'm, uh, I'm not asking that you give your phone, <laughs> phone number or anything. <laughs> Touch upon that. What what role, if any, do comments or suggestions still play in this process? Well, absolutely. We always welcome comments, and uh, I know I've spoken to you, and you've testified before, and a number of you have all you know submitted comments, and, and we've uh, done our best to accommodate a lot of them. Uh, and you know, conference is by no means a done deal. We're obviously listening to comments about all of the provisions. I think that uh, as we move forward, we'll, of course, continue to solicit advice. We're continuing to listen to talk to, uh, for example, uh, Judge Small down in North Carolina about some of the other provisions, uh, talk to your trustees about some of the provisions that affect them directly. And we're always listening to additional comments. And uh, you know, this program has been very informative to give us additional things to think about. Um, the timing, I think, is the issue. because. Mr. Gikas would like to see this move through very expeditiously. Uh, with 300, over 300 votes in the House and 80-some votes in the Senate, uh, both veto-proof majorities, we think that uh, we can move this very quickly, and we'd like to move it through as quickly as possible. So the timing is a concern. So I, I assume it's a little late, for example, for people to write you letters saying, I'm opposed to the bill. In general, it's specific suggestions that would be most helpful to you, I assume. Yeah, I think that's um, one of the... Concerns that I've had about the way this has moved forward is a lot of folks have, instead of offering uh, uh, constructive comments, have instead decided, okay, I'm going to oppose this bill, and you know, basically taken themselves out of uh, real consideration of, you know, this is a problem, we need to address it. Instead, say, well, the bill is bad, I'm going to oppose the bill the whole time. Anybody in particular in mind, Julie Erica? Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me ask you another technical question. Sure. On the question of auditing consumer bankruptcy schedules, the House bill provides that those audits should take place by licensed professionals according to generally accepted auditing standards. The Senate bill is much more flexible, allowing uh, for employees of the uh, United States trustee system uh, to conduct the audits and, and not requiring that they be done under the gas uh, provisions. Do you have any idea as to how that particular issue is going to come out, particularly in light of the fact that neither of the bills make any provision for paying for the audit? Well, the House, uh, Mr. Geekus, feels very strongly that uh, we do need to incorporate general accounting principles uh, in these audits. But, you know, as you said, the, the Senate has different principles. Um, again, you know, I don't know where this is going to come out, but uh, we, we in the House do feel very strongly about it. And we would like to see the gas retained, but that is something that, that has yet to be determined. Is there any idea of uh, how these audits will be paid for? Uh, again, that's something that, that will be addressed, I would assume, in conference. You know, uh, most of the cases to which they'd be applied would be no asset chapter 7 cases, so there uh, presumably wouldn't be <coughs> any funds available in the case itself to pay for the audit. So y is there a likelihood that there'll be a provision in the bill for the payment? Um, there, I'm assuming there will be. I mean, maybe it'll be the U.S. trustee. Uh, you know, I, I don't know at this point where, who will pay for it, but, uh, but we will address well, that. Let me ask you a, a question. 
assuming that you're right, then in fact there are bill-proof majorities, and that in fact some bills can come through. How soon is this, are these provisions, which are fairly um, broad-ranging, going to go into effect? And is there anything in the bill that people should be aware of that's going to affect existing cases, or are most of these just going to affect cases on a going-forward basis from whatever the effective date may be? Um, uh, 180 days is, is the effective date, I believe, for all the bills, although there may be some smaller provisions that where the effective date is, is a little bit less or more. About well, 180 days, do I think it can be the case is filed? Uh, I believe so, yeah. This is filed within 180 days after the bill is passed. Wouldn't that be effective? Okay. Would be the effective date. So it's, it's the case that's filed 181 days after would be the first that, right. would, would, be the, would be the first case that's effective. And so, uh, uh, in essence, existing cases by and large would be grandfathered in, and there'd be this huge window of opportunity, I guess, for filings for dead beats. Right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's been one of the concerns I know about a window is that there would be a rush to filing. I, I somewhat doubt that because I don't think practitioners generally will know what to do. two years right. by consumer right. debtor that's attorneys true. that you better file your bankruptcy now because change is coming. So I think that's and a we drum they've been beating for far too long to right. have a, a Actually, I, a lot of very responsible consumer um, bankruptcy attorneys are keeping track of those who've come in for interviews. And they think it's uh, they in, in order to discharge the professional responsibility of these people, they're going to have to assess very quickly what that bill is and tell the people whether it's in their best interest to file in 180 days or thereafter. I mean, this, this, this is... Although some people have been advertising, uh, there are a lot of people um, who are very concerned about how they can discharge a professional responsibility for someone who might have done better under, under the old law versus the new or vice versa. So, I, I want to ask about the needs, needs-based bankruptcy because, of course, that's been the big issue in this, this bill, and the versions are somewhat different in the, the House and Senate. How do you see those getting resolved? That's the big question. Um, in the House bill... The original House bill, as introduced, had a uh, uh, 5,000 or 25 percent requirement if you could meet the means test. It's now $6,000 uh, in the House provision. In the Senate, it's uh, 15,000 or 25 percent. Um, and there are other provisions and exceptions and differences in the means test that, that, uh, that exist also. Um, I wish I knew, you know, I could predict where they'll come out. Somewhere between the two bills, presumably, but um, you know that's uh, that's something that's obviously going to have to be worked out. Is that the biggest obstacle you see, Joe, coming out of this with the with the bill agreement on uh, means testing? I don't think so. Um, if you look at the last bill that we passed in the 105th Congress, the Senate bill was the, the means test in the Senate bill and the House bill were extraordinarily different. This time, they're very much closer. They started from the same premise of last, year, last session's conference report. So, you know, we're, we're pretty close together on that. I think, actually, the biggest stumbling point are some of the extraneous issues, like abortion and the uh, minimum wage and that sort of thing. What about uh, anti-commingling? From the point of view of Chapter 13 trustees, one of the most significant changes the bills would make would be eliminating the possibility of Chapter 13 debtors stripping down to the value of the collateral claims of car lenders and other secured creditors. The bills do have differing provisions regarding that. Um, do you see that as being something that would be changed uh, significantly in practice? Well, it's funny. The House and Senate provisions have sort of flip-flopped. Uh, when the House bill originally passed, it had, I think, 90 days. Uh, no cram downs for 90 days. The Senate bill had no cram downs at all. Last conference, we came up with the five-year compromise, and the House introduced the conference report from last year as this year's bill. That five years has been retained. The Senate, on the other hand, now has six months except five years for auto, auto loans. I don't know where that's going to come out, but uh, it's presumably going to be somewhere in the middle. Again, since many of our viewers are, are going to be judges, uh, and, and several of those are in districts like mine, that this bill contains see that as being controversial? Do you think that's going to stay in the bill uh, that comes out that there will be additional judgeships in some districts? I think now the number, I've forgotten the exact number of, of, of extra judges. 
House and Senate bills have a number of additional judges. I think the Senate bill has more temporary judges than the House bill. Um, and a lot of that is Senator Grassley uh, has long been uh, very concerned about the number of judges. And uh, as the principal author of the bill in the Senate, he has uh, uh, wielded his gavel and said, you know, I want to limit the number of judges. Um, we will expand the number of judges, whether or not they're permanent or temporary yet to be worked out, and the numbers have yet to be worked out. But Mr. Geek has held a hearing uh, sometime in the last year uh, on the number of judges, and we heard a lot of testimony saying we need more bankruptcy judges, and very little testimony saying we don't need more bankruptcy judges. Joe, I really want to thank you for joining us, and uh, I think it wasn't quite an inquisition, and we <laughs> appreciate you answering our questions. Uh, that's uh, it for the second part of our uh, Bankruptcy Law Update program. We hope you enjoyed both parts of the program and found them useful and, and interesting. And uh, we hope you'll take the time to fill out and send us the evaluation form for the program that is uh, on the JNET, particularly if you have something good to say. Uh, you'll also find, remember, the written materials for the course on the JNET as well. I want to very much thank our panel again for coming in to help us explore all these subjects. I know we barely scratched the surface on some, but uh, please join us for our next program in September. Until then, for the Federal Judicial Television Network, Lawrence Ponderoff saying thanks for watching.